can the book of Revelation really be understood amidst all the prophetic language and mysterious symbols? How is it relevant to the 21st century? What is the controversy between good and evil all about? How and when will it end? These and many other questions will be answered, providing amazing clarity to the conditions we see in our world today. This seminar will bring you face to face with Jesus in a new and wonderful way, leading you to the most momentous decisions of your life. Welcome to Prophecy Seminar, the book of Revelation. Here is your host, Pastor David Price. Well, good evening, friends. I'd like to welcome you to our Revelation Prophecy Seminar for session number six, when we are looking at Christ's glorious return. What a great subject this is. I think of all the topics that we can study, this has got to be one of the greatest. Let me share with you the five theme questions for tonight. Why does Jesus come back in the same way that he left? Good question. Will only a few see Jesus Christ return? Will we sleep through the second coming? Fourthly, why is heaven empty for a week? And number five, what's the test for knowing the difference between Satan's false coming and Jesus' true coming? Would you join me as we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we invite again your Holy Spirit to give us the important gifts of wisdom and understanding as we open your word tonight. We thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight for Revelation Seminar Lesson Number 6, Christ's Glorious Return. The return of Jesus to gather his people from this earth is the grand theme of the Bible. One verse out of every 11 in the New Testament speaks of this momentous event. In fact, evangelist Dwight L. Moody declared that the event is mentioned 2,500 times in Scripture. Some refer to this glorious event as the rapture, although the term does not appear in the Bible. This earth-shaking event is the ultimate goal of all Bible prophecy. The goal is more conspicuous in Revelation than any other book of the Bible. For in Revelation, Jesus' return is the most outstanding event of the book. It's the keynote of its messages. It's the hub around which its visions revolve. Each scene in this prophetic drama climaxes with the coming of Jesus Christ. To study Revelation is to become acutely aware of Jesus' second coming. No wonder the devil keeps announcing that this book is sealed. You know, it's shocking to recall that at Jesus' first coming, as a babe in Bethlehem. The people were surprised and unprepared. This was true in spite of the fact that hundreds of Old Testament prophecies, like the one on your screen, clearly described his first coming with detailed accuracy. But the people were applying the prophecies of his second coming to his first coming and ignoring those that applied to the first advent. Thus, they were prepared to reject his appearance as the infant son of a poor family. Well, as we know, history has a way of repeating itself. It's shocking to consider, but could it be possible that Christian people today may be misconstruing the 2,500 Bible prophecies of Jesus' second return? And the second question is, could they be setting themselves up for one giant mind-boggling surprise? Could even some serious Bible students be fatally confused regarding his return? Jesus solemnly warned of this sad possibility when he spoke of his return in Matthew chapter 24. And this is what he said. Take heed that no man deceive you. He further stated that erroneous concepts regarding his return would be so powerful and convincing that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very 
elect in Matthew 24, 24. Then Jesus capped it all off with this. Behold, I have told you before. I guess we would say today, you have been warned. Please join me at the top of page two. In light of this solemn warning by Jesus Christ, let us now prayerfully see the prophecies regarding the blessed rapture. Friends, on the screen, the word rapture does not appear in the English Bible. The, the original Greek word translated caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is the word harpazo. Now, in the Latin Bible, harpazo is translated raptura. Raptura means to carry off. So the English term rapture is a word from the Latin language. This Bible study in session number six uses rapture for the second coming of Christ. And that takes us to our first heading tonight. Jesus will return. Please join me at the top of page two. So two men in white clothing suddenly joined the disciples as they were watching Jesus disappear in a cloud at his ascension. What did they say about the manner of Jesus' return to the earth in Acts 1, 9 to 11? So we go to Acts chapter 1 and we start in verse 9. And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These two men, of course, were angels. These two men, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So, friends, what did the angel say about the manner of Jesus' return to the earth? It's a very cryptic um, saying that he would return in the same manner as he departed. So what does that actually mean? Let's tease it out a little bit with four key points that we need to remember. Please direct your attention to the screen. Number one, when Jesus returns, he will be visible just as when he left here in Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And the disciples and apostles saw Jesus depart in their own time frame, in their own eyesight. Secondly, Jesus Christ will return in a cloud, we were told. He left in a cloud. He will come back in the same way. And we're going to give you some extra information on what that cloud actually means as we go through the lesson. Point number C, the third point, that Jesus, when he returns, will be flesh and bones. He was flesh and bones when he left. See Luke 24, 36. And the angel said, this same Jesus will return. So he will come in the same body in which he left. The fourth point, explaining what same manner means, is this one. That Jesus' ascension was literal, personal, bodily and visible. And so his second coming, his rapture, will be absolutely the same. Thank you so much for joining us for session six. Question number two, how did John tell us Jesus would return? We go to G Revelation chapter one and verse seven, then we go to Revelation 14, 14. Revelation 1, 7, John the Revelator writes, behold, Jesus comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, friends, I'm going to ask you to direct your attention to the screen because I have some extra information. I cannot resist teasing out a little bit more out of this text. What did it mean that they also which pierced him will see him? When John writes, even so, amen, amen means may this be understood as a truth. The amen means a truth, a verity. So he's expressed a great truth in this verse that Jesus will come back with clouds, every eye will see him, but also those who had him killed at the cross will see him. What could this mean? Here's some extra information that's not 
in the lesson. Well, the statement of Revelation 1-7 clearly implies that those responsible for the death of Christ will rise or be resurrected from the dead to witness his coming, as in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. During the course of his trial, Jesus had warned the Jewish leaders of this dread event, Matthew 26, 64. So friends, this is a special resurrection for those who crucified Jesus, that is, that they were wicked people, and this takes place at the second coming of Christ. Now, in Matthew 26, 63 to 66, the Jewish high priest called Jesus a blasphemer, and he also implies, therefore, that Jesus is a liar for what Jesus says about himself as he takes unto himself the attributes of God. So let's go there and understand a little bit more about this special resurrection. And yes, it is a special revelation. Matthew 26, 63 to 66. But Jesus held his peace. This is during the trial in the court before the high priest. And the high priest answered and said unto Jesus, I adjure you by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Friends, Jesus here is referring to his power as the Son of God to return in the second coming. But our passage is not finished. Let us read on Matthew 26, 65 and 66. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He have spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard this blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He's guilty of death. So he was sentenced to death on charges of being a liar and a blasphemer. That takes us back to where we started in Revelation 1 7. Behold, Jesus comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. That is, the wicked don't want to see Jesus coming back. Let's look at our second text, Revelation 14, 14. We're discovering tonight how Jesus will return. John writes, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Well, friends, it's very hard to find um, an illustration of Jesus holding a sickle, but this is an ancient illustration, and there it is, exactly as John wrote it. So how did John tell us Jesus would return to planet Earth in the second coming? According to Revelation 1.7 and Revelation 14.14, the answer is that he would be coming back with and in the clouds. As the angels promised, Jesus, who went away in the clouds, will return in the same manner. It's a very, very important point. The Bible reports this fact too often for any to question it. The New Testament alone mentions the fact at least nine times. So what are these clouds? We go to Psalm 104, verse 3, and Psalm 68, 17, and let's compare those two. That's what CF stands for, compare. In Psalm 104, verse 3, David wrote, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters? This is speaking about the foundations of heaven. Who maketh the clouds his chariot? Who walketh upon the wings of the wind? So, friends, this is an illustration of Jesus and the angels coming down to us from heaven. Some commentators have nominated the mysterious and absolutely beautiful Orion Nebula as the throne room of heaven. And I happen to actually believe that that is correct and can be proved from Scripture. Well, let's go to Psalm 68 and verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. 
So what are these clouds? The Bible tells us very clearly that the clouds are actually thousands of angels. Isn't that interesting? We go to question four at the bottom of page two. Who will see Jesus when he comes? That's pretty important. Who's going to see him return? We go back to Revelation 1.7. Behold, Jesus cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. There is our answer. We have covered the rest of the verse, haven't we? It's every eye. This also is too plain to misunderstand. Every human being on earth will see Jesus at the rapture. This includes both saved and unsaved. Matthew 24, 30 says that all the tribes of the earth shall mourn at his appearing. And that problem is because they don't want to see Jesus and they are not ready. And that is why we need to know how Jesus will return and we need to know how to get ready. Question number five, who will come with Jesus as at the rapture? Good question. Does he come back alone? We're in Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the what? The throne of his glory. Who will come with Jesus at the rapture? The answer is all the holy angels of heaven come back with him. Wow, that's really going to be something, isn't it? Question six, we're at the top of page three. How will these angels assist Jesus in the rapture? This is very interesting and something a lot of Christians don't understand, that the angels have a work to do at the second coming of Christ. And in this illustration, you can see someone being resurrected, a mother and a child, a father and the son are there, and there are the angels doing something with the people as they're taken back to heaven. What are they actually doing? Matthew 24, 31 will tell us the answer. And Jesus shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, meaning north, south, east, and west, from one end of heaven to the other. Well, there's the work that the angels do. They are gathering the families together because people may have perished or may be located at different parts of the earth. How will these angels assist Jesus in the rapture? They will gather the elect together from all over the world. Friends, what does the elect mean? The elect actually means the chosen ones. Some people think Jesus has favorites. He doesn't. He loves us all equally. But the chosen ones are the ones who have chosen to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So, friends, these angels reunite the families separated by death and babies are put back into their mother's arms. What a day that will be. Our second heading tonight is entitled Invasion from Space. Let's go to question seven. How long will it be from the time Jesus and the angels leave heaven for this earth until they're back in heaven with God's raptured saints? That's a very good question. What is the time frame here? The answer is given in a very surprising way in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. And when Jesus had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Half an hour, what does that mean? How long will it be from the time Jesus and the angels leave heaven for this earth until they are back in heaven with God's raptured saints. Well, the Bible said very clearly it was how long? It was half an hour. Let's explain what this actually means in prophetic time. The note says, we will study the seven seals of Revelation later. In fact, we'll study that in two or three weeks' time. But briefly, the sixth seal ends as the wicked we could realize that the day of the Lord is upon them. Uh, see Revelation 6, 12 to 17. But during the seventh seal, there is complete silence in heaven for one half hour of prophetic time, Revelation 8, 1. It is silent in heaven during this time because all the angels are with Jesus for the rapture, Matthew 25, 31. And heaven will be empty. Since a day in prophecy equals a literal year, Ezekiel 4, 6, some believe half an hour would be approximately seven and a half days. I'm going to pause there and just explain this to you simply on the screen. Please direct your attention to the screen. So, friends, how long is half an hour in prophecy? 
If one prophetic day equals one literal year, then we get 365 days and we divide it by 24 hours. That gives us 15.2083333 days. I knew that you would want this to be precise. So one prophetic day equals one year. 365 days divided by 24 hours is 15.283333 days. So one hour is 15.21 days. So half an hour is 7.6041665 days or seven and a half days. Friends, this is fascinating, isn't it? It seems as though God's people take a week and a bit to get back to heaven. That would indicate to me that we are possibly taken on a tour of the universe on the way home. And some commentators would support that. The note says, thus heaven would be silent for about a week, the length of time that would be spent on the round trip for the rapture. So friends, heaven is then occupied again as Jesus Christ takes his people home. Well, that directs us to question eight towards the bottom of page three. Many beautiful Christians feel that the rapture will be a secret event. What do the following scriptures teach regarding this point? Is that correct or is that open to interpretation? Matthew 24 and verse 27 is very, very clear, isn't it? Jesus said, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus says that his coming is really like lightning. Well, friends, there's nothing secret about lightning, is there? And you know what? We can see lightning even with our eyes closed. We can see the brilliance of the display even through our eyelids. So we won't be sleeping through any of Jesus' second coming. Let's go to point number B. We're going to Psalm 50, verses 3 to 6. What are the scriptures teach on this point of whether the rapture is a secret event? Psalm 53 to 6, David writes... King David, our God, shall come and shall not keep silence. There's our first answer. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Verse 4. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For God is judge himself. What do the scriptures teach regarding this point? It's very, very clear, isn't it? That God will not keep silence and it shall be tempestuous round about him. What does that actually mean, tempestuous? The passage definitely says Jesus Christ coming won't be silent. This is a noisy, in fact, it's a noisy cataclysmic event. Please join me at the top of page four. We're going to Jeremiah 25, 30 to 33 for more information on whether the rapture, the second coming is noisy or not. Jeremiah 25, 30 to 33. Jeremiah wrote, therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. Now, I want you to pay special attention to verse 33, our last verse. This is amazing. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried, they shall be dung upon 
the ground or refuse or rubbish upon the ground. What do the following scriptures teach regarding this point in Jeremiah 25, 30 to 33? It says, the Lord shall roar from on high, he shall mightily roar, he shall give a shout, and a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. Friends, this is really a audible coming, isn't it? In every possible way. There's roaring, there's shouting, there's an incredible noise. A mighty roar, a mighty roar, a shout, and a noise heard to the ends of the earth accompany the rapture. There's nothing secret about it. And then in section D, our fourth part, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. There's our answer. It's a trumpet sound or a trumpet blast. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Notice in this illustration, we have lots of angels and many of them have trumpets, a very important part. You know, friends, there's nothing uh, quiet or secret about this event, is there? In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, again, the same themes. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God or the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The rapture will be accompanied by a trumpet sound or a blast, a shout and a voice. I remember once I was on a camping weekend with some friends, uh, some young men, I believe, and somebody played a trumpet in my ear at 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning. I jumped out of bed in my sleeping bag and promptly fell over running around. I tell you what, the sound of that trumpet was absolutely incredible, mate. There's nobody who's going to sleep through that. I've never forgotten it. So there's nothing quiet or secret about this event, I can tell you. All right, question number nine. What will happen to the righteous dead at his coming? I'm still getting over that traumatic event <laughs> We go to 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. We've just been through these, but let's go through them again. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. There's our answer. The dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible body, meaning decaying body, Verse 53, must put on incorruption, and that is the holy righteous body. And this mortal body, subject to death, must put on immortality. Isn't that interesting? We don't seem to have immortality yet, do we? It's something that we must put on. So the dead shall be raised incorruptible. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, here's our answer. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, and that's where our word rapturio comes from, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What will happen to the righteous dead at his coming? The answer is they'll be raised incorruptible in bodies that will not decay and die and get sick, and they will become immortal, not subject to death, and they'll be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Friends, please notice where we meet the Lord. Where is he? He's in the air. That takes us to question 10, halfway down page 4. What will happen to the righteous living when Jesus comes? Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Notice God's word for death there. The Bible's word for death is sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. There's our first answer. What will we be changed from? For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Friends, um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 is quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah 25, verse 8, that one day death will be swallowed up in victory. And that is assured because the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. First Thessalonians 4, 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What will happen to the righteous living when Jesus comes? They'll be changed from their corruptible, decaying bodies that get disease and die to incorruptible, non-decaying bodies. And they go from mortal to immortal bodies and they're caught up to meet the Lord exactly where? Notice that the Lord is in the air. It's a very, very important point that Jesus does not set foot on the earth at his second coming. Now, let me tell you, Jesus set foot on the earth at his first coming as a baby and a young man and as the Messiah. At his second coming, he does not set foot on earth at all because there's going to be a great test over the second coming. Then at the third coming, when the holy city descends in Revelation 21 and 22, then Jesus does set foot on the earth. And I'll give you a text for that very, very shortly. Question 11, what kind of bodies will the saints be given at the rapture? Philippians 3, Luke 24, and Acts 1. Let's have a look at it. What kind of bodies? Yes, some people say, I don't want to go to heaven and be playing a harp. I don't want to uh, be sitting on a cloud and just be some sort of spirit body. So what's the answer? Philippians 3, 20, 21. Paul writes to the church of Philippi in Greece, for our conversation is in heaven. Some versions say, for our citizenship is in heaven. Friends, this earth is not our home. This is just a temporary home. We're just passing through. So if our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also heaven, we look for the Saviour. We look for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's our answer. 21, who shall change our vile body, meaning our sinful, decaying, mortal body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious, his glorious body, according to the working whereby Jesus Christ is able even to subdue all things under himself. That last uh, sentence we actually use in memorial and burial services when we bury the dead, that they will be raised in the resurrection according to the working whereby Jesus Christ is even able to subdue all things unto himself, and that is that he can subdue and conquer the power of death. Well, there's a second paragraph we're going to look at, but before we look at it, let's have a look at the context. Do you remember in Luke 24 when Jesus turned up in the upper room and frightened the disciples after the crucifixion? Let's go there. We're going to Luke 24, 36 to 43. And as the disciples thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they'd seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Remember, they were not believing at this stage that he could be resurrected. They were very afraid. Remember, um, Thomas, the doubting disciple, unless he could see Jesus, he would never believe. Jesus goes on to say in Luke 24, 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. There's our answer. As you see me have. And when Jesus had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and feet. That would have been the crucifixion marks in his hands and feet with the nails. And while they yet believed not for joy, they were too afraid to believe this was actually happening. And they wondered, he said unto them, have ye here any meat? And the old English word meat just means food in the King James Version. Verse 42, and they gave Jesus a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And Jesus took it and did eat before them. And Jesus said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning 
me. Friends, what kind of bodies will the saints be given at the rapture? We will get bodies like Jesus, glorious bodies. We will receive immortal bodies, not subject to death, decay, or disease. What a blessing that will be. So, friends, just to summarize what we've just spoken about, about Jesus appearing in the upper room. When Jesus appeared to his disciples and ate the fish and the honeycomb, he was not a spirit. So I'm going to ask you the question, did the food then drop on the floor? Because he was flesh and bones. It did not. Remember that? Because he was not a spirit. So why did Jesus Christ come back after his resurrection in a fleshly body? It's a good question, isn't it? The lesson didn't have time to answer that, but if you'd like to jot down Hebrews 2, 14 and 16, I have an answer. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. So Jesus Christ came to this earth as a flesh and blood person. Well, I'm asking you to join me at the top of page five. Our third heading is false Christ's appear. This is a section where Jesus warns us about the coming test. There's a test, a heavenly test, before Jesus takes his people to heaven. In fact, it might even be an exam. Question 12, does Jesus come to earth or does he remain in the air at the second coming? That means does he come down onto the earth? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, 8. Then we which are alive and remain, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica in Greece, shall be caught up together with them, that's the dead in Christ who have already risen, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So I think that's very, very clear. Does Jesus come to earth or remain in the air at the second coming? The answer is that Jesus Christ remains in the air. Friends, he does not set foot on the earth at the second coming. This is a very, very important point, and that is because Satan will set foot on the earth and appear on the earth as the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have taken time to complete your lessons, you will know this is a fact, and I'm going to flesh out a little bit more about this now. So Jesus promised to return to take his people to heaven to be with him, as in John 14, 1 to 3 where Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. But notice that Jesus did not promise that at his second coming, he would immediately reign over the earth in its sinful condition. In fact, there's more information, and that is John sees the redeemed at the heavenly throne in Revelation 7, 9 to 10. So this indicates that God takes his people back to heaven at the the second coming of Christ. Question 13, suppose that a glorious being suddenly appeared in Jerusalem who claimed to be Christ and who fitted the description of Jesus in Revelation 1, 13 to 17. Let's go there. Revelation 1, 13 to 17. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like under the Son of Man, which is just a euphemism for Jesus, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the chest with a golden girdle. His hair and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet were like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Friends, this is a magnificent description of Jesus Christ. And so if any being appeared like this on planet Earth, everybody immediately would know and claim that this was the Lord Jesus Christ. So suppose this being preached warm, beautiful Bible truths with power, called fire down from heaven, healed the sick, helped stop wars, read minds, blessed children, etc., etc., etc. What would be your reaction? Well, friends, if you know God's word thoroughly, you should know at once that this person is an imposter. 
Why are we saying that? It's very, very simple. We've already discovered that Jesus is in the air at the second coming. We rise to meet him in the air, those who are alive and translated. The dead also, the righteous dead are raised, and they go into the air to meet him as well. This will all be explained in greater detail in our next lesson, lesson number seven. So, friends, this is a very interesting point that Jesus never sets foot on the earth during the second coming. Therefore, we should know at once that this being must be an imposter. We should know at once that the glorious being was an imposter because Jesus at his coming makes a sky appearance and not an earth appearance. He remains in the air while imposters appear on earth. Further, we need to remember that the devil can do five tricks. What are the five tricks? Number one, Satan can appear as an angel of light, as in 2 Corinthians 11, 14. We covered this in Revelation seminar lesson number three, which was the villain of the book of Revelation. So we discovered there that Satan appears as an angel of light, Jesus said in John 8, 12, that he was the light of the world. Jesus' symbol is light. Satan's symbol is darkness. And so we can see if Satan appears as an angel of light, that is symbology. That is a euphemism for that Satan comes to impersonate Christ. In fact, not just impersonate him, but be him. And so he will personate him. This is one of the greatest tricks that will sort out just before Jesus comes, the sheep from the goats. Well, we know that Satan can also work miracles in Revelation 16, 14. But in the Garden of Eden, Satan turned himself into a serpent. This serpent had wings. We know he had wings because he was then cursed and made to go on the ground on his belly with his tongue um, touching the dust, sensing the dust. So 2 Thessalonians 2.9 also tells us that Satan has power to do miracles. Our third point is that Satan can call down fire from heaven in Revelation 13.13. 13. He actually does through the power of the second beast of Revelation 13. But why would he do that? Why would he call down fire from heaven? Well, friends, it all goes back to an Old Testament story, the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. This is the great showdown between Yahweh, the God of heaven, and Baal, the Lord of the earth, another name for Satan. And so these priests have cut themselves, they've danced around for hours, um, and nothing has happened. The sacrifice is not being ignited. But then the Lord God comes down after Elijah's prayer, and he's called the people to say, choose ye this day whom you will serve. And so, friends, Satan is going to counterfeit calling down fire from heaven. Why will he do that? Because according to the Old Testament, this then shows that this is the true sign of God. So he counterfeits God's fire from heaven in the Old Testament by causing it to come down in the New Testament. So friends, this is very, very interesting. There's a fourth point. Satan will use and misuse scripture. He even quoted it back to Jesus. Remember at the temptation of Jesus in Matthew 4, 1 to 6, he quoted to Jesus, jump off the temple. Don't you remember in Psalm 91, it says that the angels will catch you so that you will not harm yourself, neither dash your foot upon a stone. Friends, we need to know scripture pretty well because our arch enemy, Satan, the devil, knows it way better than we do. We need to not only know it, but we need to memorize it. And then the fifth point, Satan is a wily foe because he's full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So he is going to be a really hard foe to beat. And this will not happen without prayer and Bible study and memorization of scripture. Question 14, under false Christ's appear, would it be safe to go and see a false Christ, even if you knew he was not Jesus? Well, rather than make up an answer, why don't we ask Jesus what the answer to that is? And he answered it very, very strongly in Matthew 24, 23 to 26. Jesus said, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is the Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, 
and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall but deceive the very elect. 25, behold, I've told you before, Jesus said, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Friends, would it be safe to go and see a false Christ, even though we knew he was not you, even though you knew he was not Jesus? Jesus says, Don't go. You will probably be deceived. Do not go forth. Our heading number four is entitled A Solemn Warning. Jesus clearly commanded regarding such cases that we are not to believe it is Christ, and further that we are not to go forth. Do not go forth, the Bible says. When I disobey that injunction and place myself in jeopardy, the devil has unusual advantage over me. He deceived one third of heaven's angels, Revelation 12, 3 and 4. I'd be most foolish to think that he cannot deceive a mere human being who takes himself out of Jesus' hands by disobeying God's word. Go not forth. Those who look will be deceived. The odds are about 100%. So what, so what is Satan's strategy? Join me at the top of page six. What is Satan's strategy? What is he trying to do here? Satan's strategy will be to make people think that Jesus has already come. They will be off guard and unprepared for his real rapture. We must not underestimate the devil's power to deceive. If I depend upon what I see and upon human reason and logic, Satan will deceive me. If I remember that Jesus will come in the clouds and that every eye will see him when it happens, and if I obey Jesus and refuse to go and see imposters, I will not be deceived. We are at the top of page six, and our fifth heading is the king is coming. Fifth heading out of six. Let's go to question 14. So what will the wicked do at the time of the rapture or the second coming of Christ? We're going to Revelation 6. 14 to 16. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is because there's a mighty earthquake. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Why did they do that? And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Friends, the wicked do not want to be face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. They never wanted a relationship with Jesus. They've turned their back on him. They've denied that he is even alive. Some have been agnostics and some have been atheists, but they have chosen not to follow, not to read his word, not to pray, and not to believe. So they cry for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. What a tragic day that is. Question 16, what will the Lord do to the wicked at the rapture? This is a whole stack of texts, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 to 12, a big section, Isaiah eleven four, 4, and 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. This is certainly a good Bible study workout, isn't it? Let's go to those verses now. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 8 to 12, very interesting verses. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. We'll come back to this when we uh, cover Satan and the beast and Revelation 13 and the mark of the beast. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Lying wonders are counterfeit miracles. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Friends, isn't that amazing? God allows to people to be deceived if they want to believe a lie because 
they've turned away from his truth. Let's go to Isaiah 11 and verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So remember that when we get to the text about Jesus on the horse coming in Revelation 19. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all them. Sorry, on on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What will the Lord do to the wicked at the rapture? The answer is that he'll destroy them with his brightness and with the spirit of his mouth. Question 17, why doesn't God give the wicked another opportunity to repent after the rapture in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12? Why are they lost? We've already read this, but let's go over it one more time. The wicked have all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them and perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth. So though some of them actually knew the truth. They had the truth. They knew God's word. They knew last day events. They knew the Ten Commandments. So they knew what the truth was, but they did not receive in their hearts the love of the truth. So they might have had a head trip, a head relationship, but not a heart relationship. So they received not the love of the truth, meaning they never internalized God's truth. They never internalized the message that they might be saved. So when you don't receive the truth in your heart and turn away, for this cause, God shall send them or he allows them to get a strong delusion, to get it all wrong, that they should believe a lie. Here's the punchline, verse 12 that they all might be damned, here's our answer, that they all might be damned, strong word, isn't it? Meaning lost, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Why doesn't God give the wicked another opportunity to repent after the rapture? Friends, this is tragic. They're lost because they believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Another opportunity would also be spurned by the lost. Jesus would not appear for the rapture of his people until every person on earth has heard the message of salvation. See Matthew 24, 14 and Mark 16, 15. And has made a decision for or against it. After fully understanding and fully weighing this all important issue of life and death as in Revelation 22, 11 and 12. Those who are lost have simply decided they prefer a sinner's lifestyle. They've chosen to disobey God even after they fully understand his loving call to salvation. They would be miserable in heaven. It would be cruel to include them. If I choose to be lost, God will not force me to be saved, though he will be terribly brokenhearted and deeply hurt over my decision, as in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12 that they ended up believing a lie. Friends, this is very challenging, isn't it? Not only do we need to know God's word, but by memorizing, we place it in our hearts. By putting God's word in our hearts, we then are able through the power of the Holy Spirit to live out his life within us. Question 18, we're at the bottom of page six. What threefold glory will be manifested at the coming of Jesus in Luke 9, 26? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, Jesus said. Of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he, the Son of Man, Jesus, shall come in his, Jesus' own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. We've been asked what threefold glory will be manifest at the coming of Jesus. You might have Father, Jesus, and angels. You might have Jesus, Father, and angels. But those are the threefold glories. Friends, do you remember the glory of one lone angel which caused the entire Roman guard to fall as dead men when he appeared at Jesus' tomb in Matthew 28, 2 and 4? Try to comprehend the glory of millions of angels, plus that of the Father and of the Son. This fantastic brilliance will far outshine the midday sun 
and the unsaved will be slain by its brightness. Second Thessalonians 2.8. Indeed, he's coming with power and great glory. Luke 21.27. Question 19 at the top of page 7. What will Christ the rider on the white horse and his armies do to the nations at the rapture? Revelation 19.11-16. And I saw heaven open, John writes, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, there's our answer, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. What will Christ the rider on the white horse and his army do to the nations at the rapture? This is when. He comes to show his almighty power. The passage clearly points to the destruction of the nations. And Jesus comes back as a conquering hero to claim his people back from Satan. And some of those nations that are destroyed are those who've killed and destroyed and persecuted his people. Our last heading in session number six. The glorious return is entitled, O Glorious Day. Question 20, what is the crowning purpose of Jesus' return? I think we all know John 14, 2 and 3. Jesus said to the disciples, in my Father's house are many mansions. Probably better translated, in my Father's dwelling place are many houses. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What is the crowning purpose of Jesus' return? Friends, I want you to be crystal clear on this. The real purpose of Jesus' return is to take his people and his children home. That's one of the quiz questions. Don't get mixed up and think that he just comes back to earth to kill people. In fact, there are scriptures that say that he has no death, has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and we'll talk about that in the quiz time. So, friends, are you aware the crowning purpose of why Jesus is coming back is to res rescue his people, the believers, and his children, the sons and daughters of God? We long for heaven and home. Even more importantly, Jesus and his Father long for all of us to come home. Oh, the joy of that incomparable union. Here are some exciting things to look forward to. The reunion of our loved ones in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. Secondly, the blind will see, the dumb will speak and sing, and the lame will walk again, Isaiah 35, 4 to 6. And thirdly, there'll be no more pain, sorrow, or tears in Revelation 21 and verse 4. We're going to cover that much more extensively when we do the lesson on heaven, which is in two sessions time. That will be Revelation seminar number 08. Question 21, what does Paul call the second coming in Titus 2.13? And how does he say we should feel about it or towards it in 2 Timothy 4.8? Looking for that blessed hope, there's our answer, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Let's go to 2 Timothy 4.8. Paul wrote to the young minister Timothy, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, Paul says to the young minister, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. 
what does Paul call the second coming in Titus 2.13 and how does he say we should feel towards it? He speaks there about the blessed hope and he asks us to love it. Jesus' return is indeed the blessed hope of God's people and the love that God's people have for this wonderful day is beyond description. It's the day that we are longing for. It's the day that we are waiting for. That's the day. Please join me at the top of page eight, the last page of our lesson. Can any person know the exact time of Jesus' return? Well, some people think they can. Jesus told us, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Can any person know the exact time of Jesus' return in Matthew 24, 36? The answer is no. Only the Father knows that. Of course, Jesus um, was not accessing divine information when uh, he told us that on planet Earth. On some occasions, he acted just as a man, and on other occasions, he acted like the divine son, a tremendous um, mixing together of the divine and the human nature. But now that Jesus is back in heaven, you can't tell me he doesn't know the date of the second coming because it will be time when he finishes his work in the heavenly sanctuary and the judgment is finished. Question 23, what can we know for certain about Jesus appearing? Matthew 24, 32 and 33. Jesus said, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh or near. So likewise ye, when ye see all these things, that's referring to all the signs, the signs of summer, and that also means all the last day events, know that Jesus coming is near. How close is it? It's even at the doors. How can we know for certain about Jesus appearing? Matthew 24, 32 and 33, know that it is near. It is even at the doors. Friends, it really is at the door right now, at the doorbell. When we see Jesus' last day prophecy fulfilled, then we know the coming of Jesus is very near. Question 24, how will people be rewarded at Jesus' second coming in Revelation 22 and verse 12? And behold, I come quickly, Jesus says, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Isn't that interesting, friends? The Bible is very clear there. How will people be rewarded at Jesus' second coming? Jesus comes back to reward people according to their works. Friends, that just means eternal life or eternal death. We are not saved by our works, but our works are fruit. And the root is our faith in God's grace and love and mercy. So good works are to witness to the kingdom of heaven, to bring glory to God. And so righteous deeds are the fruit of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So every man will receive according to his work. Some will receive eternal life and some will receive eternal death. Well, the Bible's clear. People be rewarded according to their deeds, according to their works. 25, will his coming be a surprise to everyone? Well, friends, apparently it will. Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man, what? The Son of Man cometh. Will his coming be a surprise to everyone? Yes, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Friends, that shows that most people are going to be really, really surprised. And the tragedy is that they won't be ready. 26, since his coming will be a surprise, what should we do to be certain we're ready when he does come? Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, be ye also ready. There's our answer. We've got to be also ready. We're always ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Friends, the hours are slipping away like sands in the hourglass. This is the way in which we've lived our lives. Since his coming will be a surprise, what should we do to be certain we're ready when he comes? We need to stay ready and always be ready. Friends, I'm going to summarise what we learned tonight in a way that wasn't really covered directly by the lesson. Number one, Christ's coming is a literal event. It's not symbolic. 
it really is going to happen. Number two, it's a personal event. It's Jesus Christ himself. He's not sending anybody else. Number three, it's highly visual. You will see it with your eyes, God willing. Number four, it's an audible event. It's not a secret coming. It's noisy. There's shouting. There's trumpets. There's tempests. There's earthquakes. Number five, his coming is a glorious event. It'll be blinding. It'll be like lightning. You can't sleep through it. Number six, Jesus Christ's coming is a climactic event. It is the end of our history here. And number seven, Christ's coming is a decisive event. It can't be repeated. It is a one and only. Therefore, Jesus Christ's coming is not a secret event. It's literal, personal, visible, audible, glorious, climactic, and decisive. There's nothing secret about that. Our last question is, if Jesus should come tonight, do you think you would be ready? Well, I'm going to say I want to be ready because I'm trying to be ready every moment of every day. And I do that by starting in God's word every morning, at least an hour in the word, and also praying and memorizing scripture and trying to be a blessing to others. Well, friends, what did we learn in our discovery points tonight? Why does Jesus come back in the same way he left? Jesus returns the same way he left in the clouds so we won't be deceived by the false coming of Christ, who is really Satan. Will only a few see Jesus Christ return? The Bible says, no, every eye will see him. As the earth spins on its axis, every eye will see him. Number three, will we sleep through the second coming? Well, you'd have to be a good sleeper. No, the brightness of Jesus' second coming will break across the sky like lightning, Jesus said. It will be like lightning. Why is, empty, why is heaven empty for a week? Jesus and the angels are on their way to take his people back to heaven. and They get a tour of the universe on the way. Seven and a half days are spent going back to heaven. There's silence in heaven about the space of half a prophetic hour. Well, what's the test for knowing the difference between Satan's false coming and Jesus' true coming? Friends, let's be very, very clear on this. Jesus never sets foot on the earth at the second coming, but he does at the third. So we know that. He never sets foot on the earth at the second coming by 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, 8. And we know he does set foot on the earth at the third coming in Zechariah 14 and verse 4. We'll cover that in another session. Friends, if you'd like some more information on Left Behind, the truth behind the secret rapture, rapture then I have some other resources to share with you, some um, programs that I've done and also a book called The Secret Rapture. Just have to contact me and I'll be happy to share that with you. Well, thank you for those who continue to do the quiz and send me all their results. Our response questions tonight, if you learn something new from God's word, I'm asking you to place a tick in box number one. Number two, if Jesus Christ is your personal saviour and you want to be ready to meet him when he comes in the clouds, I'm asking you to tick box number two. So our quiz tonight is true and false. Let's go. Question one. When Jesus returns, everyone will see him. True or false? All right. I want you to lock it in. When Jesus returns, everyone will see him. True or false? Please lock your answer in. The answer is, according to Revelation 1-7, the answer is true. Number two, Jesus' feet will not touch, touch the earth at his second coming. Is that true or false? Lock it in. What is your answer? I think that's pretty easy. I've just covered that and we can give you the text, can't we? And the answer is true. It's um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. We meet the Lord where? In the air. Number three, those who made no preparation, meaning the wicked for the Lord's return, will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. True or false? Lock it in. The answer is true. Number four, Satan counterfeits Christ's return by appearing as an angel of light. True or false? Lock it in. And we know that's true because it's there in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 15. Jesus' main reason for returning the second time is to destroy the wicked. True or false? Jesus' main reason for returning the second time is to destroy the wicked. Lock it in. And the answer is false. Why? In Ezekiel 33, 11, Jesus says, 
Um, turn ye, turn ye from your wicked ways, for I have no death in, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? So Jesus takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and in John 14, 1 to 3, he comes back for his people. So give yourself a score out of five. Friends, the Revelation Seminar Wall of Truth. Last week we did the seven churches, the messages for the future tonight. We looked at the second coming of Christ and we learned that we need to make sure that we are ready and we know exactly how Jesus comes. In our next session, we're going to learn about Satan being bound and the millennium, the 1,000 years. And in two sessions time, we're going to look at Revelation Space City and we're going to take you on a free trip to heaven. So friends, our next lesson next time is the devil chained in the bottomless pit. We're going to have a look at the millennium and learn what is the millennium. Secondly, when does the thousand years begin? Thirdly, who is alive on earth during the thousand years? When will the thousand years end? And what purpose does it serve for God and the universe? So friends, thank you so much for joining us tonight for Christ's glorious return. And let us close with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for these amazing truths that Jesus Christ will soon return. Thank you, Father, that you and the Son and the Holy Spirit love us so much. We want to be ready. Bless us as we continue to study that on that great day we'll be ready with our loved ones, friends and families, with no one missing. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us tonight for Revelation Seminar Lesson Number 6. It's been a great privilege to share this amazing information with you and i'll say thank you and wish you all the best till we meet in our next seminar session goodbye you've been listening to prophecy seminar the book of revelation with pastor david price for more information about this series you can visit the YouTube page, True Blue SDA, or one word, that's True Blue SDA.